Hello and welcome to Happy Horror Time Podcast. My name is Matt Emmert. And I'm Tim Murdoch. Today's special guest managed to survive not one, but two 80s horror films. After a prank gone wrong in the house on Sorority Row, she was the only girl who actually wanted to call the cops. Unfortunately, she was outvoted by her sisters, who all ended up dead, of course. Then she outshined a killer monkey in George A. Romero's Monkey Shines, but at least she didn't have to take a bite out of, her, of its head like her hunky co-star. She also guest starred on tons of our favorite TV shows like Grey's Anatomy, ER, and Allie McBeal, and many, many more. Please welcome to the podcast, Kate McNeil. Hi, guys. How are you today? I'm great. I am great. It's a beautiful day here in Greensboro, North Carolina. Ooh. All is well. Are you guys in L.A.? Yes, we are. we are in LA, so it's nice to, and I mean, it's a it's a nice cloudy day yeah, sweater here. Sweater weather, very different, as you know, but because you've lived I've in LA, been obviously. Hearing, I've I've only been out of LA for a few months, but I it's crazy the weather you've been getting. Well, we heard or we read, sorry, that you grew up in Philadelphia I and. Did were in a lot of plays in high school, but according to the very trustworthy Wikipedia, which, you know, is <laughs> the best place to do research, you said that you were also a little wild back then. What did you mean by that? And can you kind of take us through those years and how you got involved in acting? Wow. Um, I wonder when I said that. <laughs> um, I was kind of a party girl in my youth. Uh, I guess middle school, high school, was a little bit rebellious. And probably it was finding my my people in little theater in high school that kind of got me back on track, you know, sort of felt like I fit in. I think because of the way I looked, which was very wholesome, you know, uh, kind of nice girl, but that's not really how I felt inside. I felt kind of angry and rebellious. I lived in a very conservative place. And for whatever reason, I was just kind of born this. I had a sixth grade teacher who called me a bleeding heart liberal. <laughs> you know, Wait, I, was like, I was 11 wow. years old or 12, wow. me a bleeding heart liberal. So, you know, there was something that just didn't really jive with me in my what they call mainline Philadelphia I don't know, I'm sure you've seen the Philadelphia story. Yeah. Classic film. Um, very conservative, pretty wealthy, very Republican. Mm -hmm. So I think I didn't really feel like I fit in there. But then I found the theater and went to college as a drama major, went to graduate school for a year, got on a soap opera. But first I did House on Sorority Row before I got on the soap opera. But it was sort of acting that gave me the permission to, you know, be open about how I felt and what I saw. And, you know, emotions were very restrained and restricted where I grew up and how I grew up. And that never really felt comfortable for me. Yeah. So to answer your question, I think that's really what led me to wanting to be a performer. Also, I loved old movies. I mean, I was obsessed with black and white films um you know all the great frank capra and billy wilder that's those were the films i adored as a kid well so that's a, a leads us to our next question is like when growing up were you a fan of horror films and if not were there any that you knew of or had seen that made an impact on you or stuck with you at a young age I wouldn't say I was a fan, but they absolutely had an impact on me. I mean, I was just, I went to see The Exorcist. I guess that must have been high school. I was pretty young, maybe 10th grade, maybe even, I don't even know what year that was. But I remember not being able to sleep for days without the light on. I would get so affected by them. I saw Psycho when I was in middle school. I went to my best friend's house. We watched it together. I knew nothing about it. My father thought it would be funny to hide behind a tree as I was walking home from her house to my house. We had big yards and there was a fence in between. And he came out behind the tree and just like snapped a twig. I know this makes him sound like a psychopath, but he wasn't. <laughs> but we both like didn't scream, dropped to the ground, hit our hands our head in our hands and started to cry like 
great defense there. You know, he could have. Uh, the murderer could have gotten us any second. So I was really, really upset by them. And that's why I'm not really watched that many. You know, that's so funny because my dad used to do and I absolutely love my dad. We have a great relationship, but he used to like as a kid and I watched horror movies all the time, but he used to always whisper Freddy, like about like Freddy Krueger, like <laughs> yes. when I was going to bed and like just to scare me. And I look oh. back and I'm like. You asshole. Just kidding. No, no. I know. And by the way, that movie freaked me out. I, I just I hated that idea that you couldn't go to sleep. No. Or, oh, yeah. Right? That's the thing. Going the to sleep seven. for that. You're done. Yeah. And, yeah. and before we jump into your horror films, we saw that you were on a soap as the world turns from 81 to 84. What That's was true. the most bonkers storyline your character had on the show? Oh, my God. I'll tell you. It's funny. I was such a. I was such a bad girl and I, the, the plot lines weren't, I mean, I didn't have, you know, like preeclampsia, like every other pregnant person on the show, or I didn't, you know, it got a little bonkers, but mostly because I was evil, I was always talking to myself, you know, it was like, well, I'll stop him. Or, you know, you were always giving the audience the, what was going to happen the next day or what happened yesterday. And anyway, I was cons. I would say to them, can I just do this in voiceover? Is there any reason why we can't record this? And I could be thinking it, but no, I had to always say everything. All my evil plans had to be, you know, told to the audience before I did them. But I was always like stealing formulas and becoming rich or I slept around a lot. I remember my mother was horrified that I was such a slut on the show. You know, <laughs> I'd always played such good girls, but on this soap opera, I was the bad girl. And in fact, Meg Ryan was the good girl. Oh. And, uh, and, and, you know, we, we are kind of similar types yeah. and uh, it was, it was great fun to be so evil, you know, it was very outlandish, you know, it's rare that you're asked to do things that are so, so bold and so out there. And I really, really, really enjoyed that. I have to say it was Meg, fun. Meg Ryan did a horror film too. She did Amityville did? three and three D. Yeah. Oh, with God. Lori Lott playing, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so many people have done or, or came from horror or something, but that's Absolutely. so funny. I, yeah. I'm sure but you I, saw I, it. I did, like soap operas, you know, they were opportunities to, to learn your craft. I mean, like when we did house on sorority row, I, True story. I, I I know this is on my IMDb page, but I answered an ad in backstage. You know, it was non-union. Um, it was an opportunity to go. And, and then I look back at the people who worked on that production designer, uh, Vince Panino. Is that his name? He had done all he did all of John Waters films in Baltimore as production designer, set designer. You know, so it, it was really interesting. But literally, we were moving lights, and <laughs> sets and working all night long for 50 bucks a day. But it was a great education. It well, really yeah. I was going to ask you during the audition process, was Kate the one person you auditioned for? Did you audition for any of the other six girls? No, because they had already cast it. And I don't remember what happened to the actress who played my part, whether it didn't work out or whether she dropped out. I don't know. But the only reason I got in, it was already cast, is because she, whoever was supposed to play the part left. And so it was an opportunity. And I answered this ad and I got the part and... I think she went up to the do attic. You, do you remember who was supposed to play the part? Was it Meg Ryan? It was Meg Ryan. <laughs> it was Meg Ryan. And whatever happened to that poor soul? <laughs> no, did they ever tell you who it was? No. no? Uh, well, if you're out there. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I no. I do. No. I do. I, and and what well, we were going to ask, so, okay, so you you answer the ad, you audition, you get the part, you find out it's like a lead. I mean, and did you find out right away it was like the final girl, the lead of the of the movie? Honestly, I don't remember. All I remember is that all of a sudden I'm in Baltimore and we're living in these sort of like dorm like situation, all the girls. And we, you know, we did not shoot day for night. We shot nights for a very long time. So it was kind of bizarre and exhausting, but also, you know, it was it was like horror summer camp. 
You yeah. I, and did you how did you feel about being cast in a horror movie at the time? Because that was 1982. It's like the heyday of slasher films. Like, was it just, oh, this is just a job to you? Or did you know that horror was like very popular then? I think I was very excited to. Well, here's the truth. I had gotten a job waitressing at a famous restaurant called Cafe Central in New York. And it was famous because so many movie stars went there and owned the restaurant. It was like a club almost. And they were open till five o'clock in the morning. And I was the worst waitress who ever lived, but I was only there. I don't know. Years. I could, I could give you a run for your money. Tim was the worst waitress ever. <laughs> okay, well, I spilled um, mozzarella salad in Robert De Niro's lap. Okay. You went. No way. What did he, he say? He was not amused oh. at all. He was eating with Joe Pesci. And they were wearing both leather jackets, this I remember, and the like mozzarella and olive oil just slid off the plate onto De Niro's lap. And I thought he might punch me, honestly. But Chino, I mean, uh, Pecci thought it was the funniest thing in the world, but I was mortified. Oh, my I God. I one that I, it was my first day, the entire two weeks. I, But the reason I tell you this is because House of Sorority Row got me out of that job. Oh, <laughs> Able to stop being a, a very bad waitress and got an acting job. And uh, so I was thrilled. What I, I did not know much about horror film at all. And to be honest, probably a good thing that I was as young as I was, because just in terms of, you know, feminism and all that later on, I might have had some feelings like, oh, I don't know, you know, because it is such a. The, those tropes of the bad, sexy girl getting murdered and, mm -hmm. and all that are a little disturbing. I love the way Scream played with all that. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah times, I think people, after 15 years of that, people right. started catching on like, hey, like they're like, not you don't have to be a virgin to survive anymore. Yeah. Until, but, but I will say your character, um, K Katie, like she is very smart and the only one who's empathetic. And those are tropes that I like. You know what I mean? Like, meaning I no. like. I that agree. being a good quality, being self-aware, like I think like I once read an interview like, you know, John Carpenter who did original Halloween. I always talk about it's my favorite horror movie of all time, but it's terrible film, they, no, the, the best <laughs> film of all time. They gave they always gave him shit because they're like, oh, you kill off the girls who have sex with their girl or boyfriends. Whoa, that's a different movie. Um, And keep <laughs> yeah. the one who's like the smart studying one. And he said, no, actually, she was just more aware of what was going on the other girls were so concerned with just like their boyfriends Boys. and other stuff yeah. that they did they weren't able to think and like actually use their brains to get out of the situation i kind of like it described that way like your character is like wait like we just did something horrible right. we and, need to be concerned there is a guy in the movie that totally likes you and like with his preppy sweater vest but you just you don't have time because you're thinking about that person you killed i know <laughs> by the way I mean, yes, I do put up a little bit of a fight, but not that big of a fight. <laughs> They're like, well, you no, do get drugged. Like, oh, OK. Yeah. You know? it, it is, now, we had heard you say in an interview that I think you were paid only like 50 bucks a day because it was so low budget. And you said and you were talking about the accommodation. So you said you guys all lived like dorm style. So you were living. Were you sharing a room with a different with one of the girls? And maybe <laughs> <laughs> honest to God, I I, I wish I could remember it better. I don't. Um, and it didn't feel like there was a lot of sleeping. But I mean, I know we were all in the same place. I don't, it must have been a campus of some sort outside of Baltimore. I bet it was. But it's it's a little hazy, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> and, you, and you had to dye your hair brown for the role. Yes. And how? why is that? <laughs> That's a great question. I think, again, that has to do with the trope of blondes are not as bright, right? And brunettes are more serious. And I think that was probably what was behind that. That's I love so these, funny. like, the just, you know, like, these outer funny in 20, 2023, looking back and thinking, like, wow, hair color? Like, right. like it's such defines, a determining factor. Oh, my God, Tim, you're blonde. You're dead. Well, it's gray, but thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, your co-star Harley Jane Kozak, who played Diane, went on to star in Arachnophobia, another horror film we love. And Eileen Davidson, who played uh, bad girl Vicky, was on Days of Our Lives and in The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Just out of curiosity, did you watch Beverly Hills? I never did. But I was in a restaurant with my grandson the other day and 
I think she's on Young and the Restless now. Yeah. There's not that many soaps left anymore, but Eileen has lasted all these years. In fact, my husband was a stage manager and he worked with Eileen on Young and the Restless. But anyway, I looked up at the TV and there she was. She looked pretty great. Oh, I was going to ask you, like, out of all the girls, which one do you keep in contact with uh, the most? I probably Eileen, because I saw I mean, I haven't kept in contact really with anybody. I used to see Harley at auditions. And at one point she told me she was writing mystery novels. And I think she was pretty successful doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if she's still acting or not. So I would see Harley, but haven't in a long, long time. And the last time I saw Eileen is when we went to the premiere of the remake of House on Sorority Row. And that was fun. <laughs> and also Eileen and I did a, um, with Mark Rossman, the director, uh, what do you call it for the blue, for the Blu-ray or whatever we did a special interview. features. Yeah. Yes. Special we saw it. Yeah. Yeah. We, we it? watched them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and well, and now you may not remember this, but we definitely do in the movie, like speaking of real housewives kind of behavior, there's a big slap between you and Eileen Davidson where you slap her. We're just wondering how many times did you have to film that? And was it a real slap? It probably was. And I actually don't remember. <laughs> it's funny because I got slapped once on as the world turns and I couldn't hear for like three days. It was actually not funny. She got me right in the, <laughs> eardrum but i think it was a real slap i don't remember any kind of stage you know uh anyone choreographing any kind of stage fight or anything i'm sure it was real you didn't she have a like, stage combat sure. team <laughs> no there was no stage combat team <laughs> i'm thinking yeah, on the is. low budget movie i'm sure whole we really thing. did slap each other yeah that's so funny and so now for you personally and when you were in college were you more like your character good girl katie or eileen davidson's character bad girl vicky i would say somewhere in between Definitely in between, you know, I, I like to party. I had a really good time, but I was pretty serious uh, acting student. I, mean, I took it pretty seriously. I, I took myself pretty seriously for a long time. You know, I was very, I've always been very political and like bleeding heart liberal. In sixth grade. <laughs> 11 years old, <laughs> 11 years old, you know, I mean, always sort of feeling, wanting to fight for the, the underdog, but at the same time, I loved, you know, to go out and have a good time and party and all that stuff. But I have a feeling if you accidentally played a prank on a teacher that resulted in their death, you'd probably call the cops. I can't imagine that I wouldn't, honestly. <laughs> yeah. No, I would. <laughs> I'm always like in real life and in the movies, it's like I would be so afraid of getting caught. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm much too terrified of the consequences. Yeah, I, I, I related most to your character. Yeah, well, that's the thing. And it's like, but the funny thing about, I think a reason why also House on Sorority Row resonates even today, other than all those tropes, you know, girls getting killed one by one, a, a freaky mass killer. Um, is it movies like, like, I know what you did last summer, like these movies where they make people like come to a moral what choice. Would you do? What would yeah. you do if you, if like right. something you did result in a death right. and they always make the wrong choice. Always. There's no movie if you make the right choice. <laughs> can you, can it over. You, we called the cops. Can, can you imagine if, if your character okay, don't call movie, the cops, you get yeah. taken away, we're good. <laughs> Are you guys aware, just made me think of this, that the, um, the house mother, what was her name? The character Slater. Down. Well, Mrs. Slater. Slater was her yeah. name. Her but voice it was... is totally dubbed in the movie. Yeah, you can tell. I, I did read I know, something. It's not great. I don't know why. I, I don't remember as we were shooting it thinking this needs to be dubbed. But obviously... Har Harley said on the DVD that her voice didn't sound like scary enough to threatening enough to you guys. So they dubbed it to, to be more. I guess that must have been why. Yeah. yeah, there's some IMDb thing that said the director, I guess, didn't think her voice was like husky enough. But I'm thinking so literally the entire movie you were acting with someone and then you see the movie and it's a different voice. It's a different voice. And it just felt dubbed to me, to yeah. be perfectly honest. I, I didn't I, mind. I, <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't know until I read that. But now, of course, when we watch it, I'm like looking for that in her. Well, of course, it would to me because it would sound so artificial um, I'm glad it doesn't seem that way, but it really did feel that way when I saw the movie. Um, and and you, it's also um, Mark Rosman. He he uh, directed and wrote it, and it was his first time. What was it like working with the first time director? Well, he was a, he's a sweetheart. He's the nicest guy. But we used to joke that it was his bar mitzvah money. <laughs> I don't know if I should say that, but that was our joke. 
That you know, is hilarious. He was so young and it was like, how is this guy doing this? You know, but he did. And he was very professional, prepared, serious. I mean, I can't tell you any funny, fun stories about Mark other than that he was a really good guy, but he was not fooling around. I mean, he was prepared and he knew what he was doing. I'm Jewish and had a bar mitzvah and remember getting money. And if I could have used it on a horror movie, I would have. Do would you, it be a fraternity? Did he go to film school, Mark? I, think I he, don't, did, I don't know. I, did he go to, I'm trying to remember in this interview. Did, I mean, I, he did go and then he got he some money to make a movie. Right. Yeah. yeah. He was, it, he seemed very young to us, but he, he definitely pulled it off. I mean, we respected him. We did. No, that's great. So, yeah. okay, on to the pool, which looks incredibly <laughs> gross in the film. And, you know, after the house mother, Mrs. Slater, gets accidentally shot and killed by Vicky, she falls in and you jump in after her. So how gross really was the pool and how many times did you have to actually jump in? It was a lot and it was really gross. I do remember because I think they'd let it um, sort of. They, I think they purposely worked on it to become like that for a while. I don't know what they did to get it so disgusting. I don't think it was like that was the way the pool was. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I just remember they put stuff in our ears and eyes when we would jump out. They must have had some kind of, I don't know what it was. But nobody got sick. But it was really gross. That really pool is huge, by the way. It is such yeah. a huge pool. I mean, I don't know if it just looked yeah. like that on screen. but No, it was. It was big and it was you know, bit of a ways from that, that main building. But yeah, it was really, really gross. It was not something that you were like looking forward to. You're like, just going to take a nice little dip. I want to take a dip. It's hot out. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was really gross. So you're the final girl of the film, as we said, but the ending is a little, it's a little ambiguous because the killer who, spoiler alert, we'd spoil everything, um, is revealed to be the house mother's so long lost son. Stop it. Uh -oh. Go watch it. Come back. I mean, long lost son, Eric, and he opens his eyes right before the credits roll. Yeah. So now I know there were some alternate endings that were kind of conceived. But before we get to that, what did you think of the um, ending? And was it creepy kind of filming opposite a killer in this clown costume, which I found really scary, Me too? I love it. Uh, well, clowns are just terrifying, aren't they? I mean, they just they're just inherently scary. They just are. I always think of like Wayne Gacy. You know who that oh, is? Oh, God. Yeah. So I don't remember. I knew that that was an alternate ending. Now I can see why they did. I mean, they love that horror films, right? Is it Carrie where the hand comes up at the end, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, you love that idea of not having finished business. Uh, I guess the the original ending was me surviving and vanquishing and, and killing him. But I think it's a good ending. You know, I think it's good to leave it kind of open ended. We, Maybe we also we still shoot House Sorority, House and Sorority Row Part Two. <laughs> Well, I mean, we read also that and I don't know if maybe I don't know if you remember if they actually filmed this, but there was an ending that they scrapped where you were actually going to be found floating dead in the pool in the clown costume. Did we shoot that? I don't know. <laughs> I think I would remember that. Yeah, they, uh, apparently, I think on the DVD, you maybe see shots like either storyboards or something. So maybe they didn't actually shoot it. it I, was don't think, I can't. Yeah help but think i would remember that yeah you'd have to yeah. remember putting on a clown costume and floating in a gross pool yeah <laughs> <laughs> but god knows that's a long time ago yeah uh, um after the film was all finished and wrapped was there a red carpet premiere cast and crew screening and what did you think of yourself on the big 35 millimeter screen when it was all done excellent questions was it in the movie theater I don't remember seeing it in a movie theater. I remember seeing Monkey Shines in the movie theater, mm. but I do not remember seeing House and Sorority Row in a movie theater. And I don't remember the first time I saw it, but you know, it's for me and every actor is different, but it was always hard to watch myself. I mean, there's just, the, it, you know, it was a pretty melodramatic part. <laughs> I tried so hard to pick and choose my moments, you know, because I knew I was going to have to sustain this, terror for such a long time and there's that period where she's drugged and that helped because she's kind of out of it there you know so i didn't have to be so terrified all the time but you know it, it was something that i tried because if you start up too high 
you've got no place to go. And I, and I was aware of that. Um, but honestly, watching myself, I mean, the co- I mean, it wasn't the most flattering character physically, not that I'm that vain, but of course I am. But, um, <laughs> you know, the, the costume was like, Katie's wearing pants for some reason. Everybody else is like in a cute dress. I'm wearing like this sweater top and pants. But you had a well, cute belt. Well, you know, um, uh, belt. girls that wear <laughs> skirt, you, girls that wear skirts and dresses get killed. That's right. Well, there, there's that too, of course. <laughs> um, I was very practical. I think I was the practical one. Mm. Um, so you know, I I don't know when I. But honestly, I don't know when I've ever watched myself and been like really comfortable. It's oh hard. gosh. I watch myself in a TikTok and I say I'm brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. I don't know. I just think it's really hard. You you sound different than you think you're gonna sound. You know, you look that's what Mrs. Slater said right? when she saw the movie. That is exact <laughs> what she's I uh, does that how I sound? <laughs> no well I mean to be honest and again we're not just saying this because we're big fans but like we thought you really sold yeah, the role, yeah, really. Like we, you. and I know, like it's different when you're watching yourself, but like you, not just like, just you could, you empathize with your character, you really do, and you want the survivor final girl to be a likable character, and you're definitely like the yeah. practical, likable voice of reason, yeah, the voice of reason, and I think that really helps because there's so many mean characters in this movie, yeah, that- and wacky. But you're right, they are mean. When I think about them, none of them are very nice. No, yeah, and, and they're, they're playing with just- guns. <laughs> yeah, and they're more than happy to just, you know, kill this woman and go on, have some fun. Yeah, do not cancel that party. Don't do cancel, not the cancel party. that party. Do not no cancel the party. Hey, we've worked hard for this party. Yeah. Yeah. And and since the killer is still alive at the end, was there ever talk of doing a sequel? And like, Not that I know it? of. Yeah. Not that I know. I think that film really became popular, you know, like so many after the fact. Yeah. You know? I don't remember anyone in the first 10 to 20 years. <laughs> and now people are, you know, want to talk about it. It's really interesting. There's so many people that are, you know, just so interested in all the films that have been made. And I mean, I too love film history. Yeah. So it's just horror film has not really been my, my genre, but I just love that people care about it. And it, 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 it feels good. Yeah. It's just, just something so creepy about like this mother hiding a child in an attic and he also dresses like a clown. So there's always going to be, it's never going to go away. We're always yeah. going to be curious about and it. And sorority sisters with that have gross pools. Right. I mean, that's scary enough. Well, there's something about sororities too. I mean, I, something about that whole thing that seems to be interesting to people, you know, just like it's a good, it's a good set piece for things to go awry i think sorority house massacre yeah. so right? there's at least there's a million sorority there's so, one right there's a yeah, few you um so you had said um that you and eileen davidson went to the premiere of the remake in 2009 because for listeners who don't know they did a remake called sorority row it's kind of a loose remake because it had the same overall yeah, plot but yeah by any means exactly the same yeah, yeah definitely not um um so what did you think of the remake and did you chat with any of the girls that were in the new movie they weren't the in any way interested in us nor do i think they even knew we existed quite frankly um i did not think it was very good um i don't remember it terribly well as i said i was really kind of thrilled to see um carrie fisher cuz i was big fan of hers as a writer, especially. Um, but yeah, I didn't think it was very good. <laughs> you know what's very, crazy? I totally forgot Carrie Fisher was in that movie. She's I'm the cool. house mother. Yeah, that's what I mean. But like, the whole thing is the yeah. house mother isn't the one who gets killed. They act, One of the girls gets killed. Right. The and it's the spoiler alert. It's a boyfriend doing the killing. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I don't remember too much. I remember uh, Rumor. Mm-hmm. Um, Willis. Willis was in it. And that's about all I remember. But I didn't think it was very good. Was Did, Demi there? Demi Moore? No. So she might have been. Hmm. I didn't see her. Um, um, so a crazy question. But since you said, you know, that people are talking about it again today, if let's say Mark Rosman or someone else wanted to reboot the original House on Sorority Row and have you come back, would you be up for reprising the role of Katie? I don't know why not. I mean, I don't really <laughs> act anymore. It would be a hoot. Yeah. I just think it would be a hoot. 
We love to hear that. Oh because, my God. Well, first off, now is t- this decade is ripe for reboots of horror franchises. I mean, you know, with Jamie Lee Curtis and all the Halloweens. Right. And um, they're doing a Crystal Lake series, bringing back Adrian King, who was the original star of Friday the 13th. Like, I mean, you could grow up and be the house mother of a sorority. How amazing would that be? I could wear a fat suit, maybe. <laughs> this isn't on our notes, but I'm just curious. When did you first hear the word final girl? Like, because you are the oh, final girl. I, I don't you know. I never, it's funny. I never thought of it as final girl. I just thought of it. Honestly, this is how I thought of it. This is another trope of horror movies. There's always one girl who is like looking for clues and, you know, searching for answers. I mean, wouldn't you not like run out of there so fast and escape? Like in what planet are you going to stay in that house? Yeah. Right. Like what's, I mean, I know I got drugged. That would, that made it hard to leave. That's true. But. (laughs) I mean, as soon as things start to go off the rails, I'd be out of there yeah. as fast as I could. Yeah. But there has to be somebody who's, you know, looking for the answers, who's searching for her friends, right? And after you find one dead, that's enough, right? <laughs> I don't need to find the rest of them. I'm so, out of I- there. Here it is. See, you just said, I, okay, I'm, I'm having some thoughts. The sequel, you're the house mother. And when something happens, you're immediately telling the girls, girls, get out of here. Yeah. Get and the movie out of over. the house. Right? Get out, yeah. Get but out really, of the house. I think you've now married Eric, the long lost son, and you guys are in on the killing together. Yeah. Imagine what our babies would be like. Cute Didn't clown. He have, like birth defects or something. I, I mean, think they, he was, there was something wrong with him. We never saw his horrible face. Horrible at yeah. birth that went uh, wrong. Yeah. Right. Because <laughs> there is a flashback. Yeah, yeah. So, flashback. okay. Um, Moving on to the 1988 psychological horror film and George A. Romero's uh, second studio film, Monkey Shine. So how did you get involved with this film? And what was your first impression of the script and playing this monkey trainer, Melanie Parker? I wanted it desperately. I fought really hard for it. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, I was, it was, it was easier back then in that you didn't necessarily have to be a star like you do now, even like to get a recurring part in a TV series, you know, it's hard because so much is star driven these days. But back then, you know, I had a shot at stuff and it was a great casting director, Diane Crittenden. I liked the script. I think I probably knew about uh, Night of the Living Dead as a classic. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was a great part. You know, I love the idea of this woman being, you know, training the monkeys to help a quadriplegic. But the the problem was I had just given birth and I was too chubby. And even in the film, I'm a little heavy for, you know, a feature film. And of course, even then, you know, you you couldn't be thin enough. So it was really predicated on whether I could lose enough weight fast enough. And my baby, Emma, who's now 35, (laughs) uh, is was, uh, you know, just a couple months old when this all started to happen. And they they wanted me. So I, I had to keep going back in to read. And finally, and this is actually very humiliating and I can't believe I did it, but I wanted it so bad. I had to go to the producer's office, Charles Evans and Peter Grunewald in a bathing suit to show them that. I, and I had been starving myself. Oh, and um, I remember I wore, uh, you know, those pantyhose that suck everything in what are they called control top spanks I wore high, <laughs> like miss america i wrote i wore high heels control top panties and a very tight one-piece bathing suit and had to like parade around in the office which was awful but i guess it was enough because i got the part and wow. i think hollywood's first, terrible I know. <laughs> it's pretty awful now again we're talking about 1988 not that these humiliating things don't happen all the time to young actresses now. Um, I think, though, 
I don't know. I don't think everybody has to be emaciated these days. Maybe. I mean, I think I, Hollywood's getting better. I, I, th- I mean, bit. yeah, and I can't speak because I'm not in the yeah. industry, but I do like body positivity is such a big thing. And they're like, I, you see a, some diversity, a in, like, a sizes, but it is still very just a little bit. There's still oh. a lot of progress that needs to be made. Well, that was awful, but I did get the part. And so that's basically how that happened. I read several times, but mostly it was about, could I lose enough weight fast enough? Wow. Oh, gosh. I mean, I did, can't even did, like, did not they do like enough. weigh-ins for you? No, they just looked at me. Oh, oh. God. Oh, so in way, they didn't weigh me. Thank God. That would have been oh. awful. Well, I mean, this is a side note, but the girls on the facts of life at one season, all the producers made them get on a scale. Fun, oh fun fact. Yeah, that's a sitcom. Wow. Um, I mean, there's so many <laughs> stories. We could wow. go on and on and on. And believe me, there's not an actress in the world that doesn't have them. Uh. Um, so that was yucky. But <laughs> then um, we were in Pittsburgh, which was great fun. My daughter, I was there from the time my daughter was like three to six months. And it was, I can honestly say one of the happiest times of my life. I loved everything about it. I loved the part. I loved George. You know, this man who makes these, who made these really disturbing films was about the kindest, warmest. I'm sure you've heard this from many people, but just wonderful guy. And I loved him. I wished I could have made many more movies with him. Um, and it was fun. I loved John Panko so much. He was a riot. Jason was very intense, but it was a very intense part. Yeah. Um, I love um, Joyce Van Patten was a riot. She's Great hilarious movie. in the film. But what was it like so, working with horror icon Tom Savini in The Monkeys? Yeah, was I mean, you know, yeah. Was, so that was, I, I didn't appreciate it at the time. And of course, he wasn't quite the legend that he is now at the time. But he was awesome. You know, the last acting gig I did was a show called Them Covenant for uh, Amazon Prime. And it was a spooky show. It was just right before COVID. Oh, and Them? The show Them. The, the, them. Yes, yes. Okay, yes, of course. I played an evil, uh, racist psychiatrist who was lobotomizing Black women. It was like, I, rem- I watched the show. I remember. Disturbing part. Very. But, uh, <laughs> and in you know, it's like it was not comfortable to be that person on a set. You know, it was just like awful, but it was a good part. Anyway, the head of special effects was uh, had come up with uh, Tom and actually worked on Monkey Shines. And I, I his name is Greg Nicoletto. Nic- Nicotero. Nicotero. Nicotero, yeah. yeah. Yes. And he has his own special effects studio in Los Angeles. And it was really cool because I showed up there to get a thing in my head, you know, cause they were going to kill me. And, um, and, and I saw him and we talked, it was just great fun. And, and it was Tom Savini who gave him his first shot in the business. He was just a kid when he worked on, I don't even know if he was out of high school when he worked on monkey shines, I could be wrong, but he was young. Anyway, Tom was amazing. It was very cool. And looking back, even cooler, because now I know what a big deal he is. The monkeys, you know, is one of those typical actor things where they're like, how do you feel about monkeys? The monkeys <laughs> were terrifying. And, you know, they're, they're, you know, you hear about monkeys ripping people's faces off. I get it now. I remember I, the, they had me hang out with the monkeys for a while. And I went into a room with all these monkeys that actually did work with this group that trained them to be, uh, to work with uh, people who were paralyzed. And they said, just don't go up to them too quickly. Don't, you know, make eye contact, just let them get used to you, go in the room, sit down, let them come to you. And I had long hair then. And I remember a monkey just immediately jumped up and like grabbed me by the hair and like was swinging off. And it was like, all I could do not to scream and go running out of the room. And, you know, and I sat there and, you know, hung out with the monkeys. But did I love the monkeys? I did not love the monkeys. Yeah. Well, I, I have to. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a really good actress because I have Oh, to you work. look like you. Yeah. Love, oh, yeah. Well, I was going to ask, and how often, but because I read that, like, it, you, obviously there were real monkeys, but there are also some puppets that were. So how often was it real monkeys versus puppets and all of that? Well, um, I can only speak for myself. It was 
usually real, except in that last scene where the monkey's trying to poke the needle and, you know, on the rainy night and I'm passed out and I have to wrestle with a monkey briefly with a real monkey, which was horrifying. Um, But then most of it was a puppet, you know, I'm like writhing, holding onto the monkey, but they did get a couple shots of a real monkey on my back, like looking up, I'm holding its paws. So you were wrestling with a real monkey (laughs) for a minute. For but minute, mostly yeah. it was a puppet, yeah. Oh, uh, and I was like, were there and also with dealing with the monkeys, as you can tell, we're very interested in these yes. monkeys. No, did they well, was that's there, I mean, that's the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Were there many times when I mean, obviously they're not gonna take direction well, like did they mess up a lot of scenes? Did you have to do take over take? Like, is there anything you remember where they just screwed I up? I just remember not so much that, but I remember you know, there was more than one monkey that played Ella. And, but I think the most favorite one, it was interesting. She was in heat and she started sort of flirting with Jason. And I think they got some cool shots. <laughs> I mean, she was rubbing up against him and coming on to him. And it was really weird and creepy, but kind of cool. I mean, I think they got some good shots out of it. And but, then Jason ended up marrying that monkey yeah. after the production. <laughs> that's that's the sequel. That's the sequel. So well, well, speaking of your co-star, Jason, is it Begay? How do you pronounce his name? Begay. Um, so you have a very intimate love scene with his character yeah. Alan. Oh, yeah. And we read that it was originally shot more explicitly, but was later toned down. Was that uncomfortable to film? And what would did you think at the time? Because I think that was the first time there was ever a love scene with a paralyzed character in it. Well, I'm thinking coming home probably was first, right? Oh, with Jane Fonda. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. And John Voight. And it's a similar situation. I think Um, I can't remember, but um, you know, I was, it was very embarrassing. (laughs) And uh, I, we drank some champagne to be perfectly honest. I remember um, and it was kind of all on me because he's paralyzed. Yes. Right? <laughs> so, um, however, I did feel like it was, I didn't think it was gratuitous. Mm-hmm. It made a lot of sense just in terms of the uh, restrictions of the character. And I thought it was pretty pretty romantic and and beautifully done and george was so sweet he let me keep my shirt on unbuttoned you know which was kind of sexy but not you know it was like i didn't have to be topless yeah uh which i was really grateful for um so i, I at the end of the day i was very pleased with how it came out yeah. but it was not fun to do yeah <laughs> i'm sure when janine I- turner left him you know, did you oh, did you get to work with Janine Turner or Stanley Tucci? No, I mean, what a cast, Stephen Root. Yeah, but all of those people were. Uh, I mean, that goes to speak to the great casting director Diane Crittenden. I don't know, is she still alive? It's amazing. Some of these people are still casting things that I knew way back when. But yeah, I mean, none, no one, uh, Tucci, Stephen Root, Janine. I mean, um, had done very much. I don't think not. A yeah. whole lot. We're all about the same age, but I didn't really get to work with any of them because they were a separate plot line. Yeah, but that sounds great. I mean, it's really nice to hear that about George A. Romero, just because he's such a legend. He was such a legendary horror oh, yeah. director, and you know, it's almost like you want to hear that your heroes are good people. And it sounds like he was a really great guy. Well, I didn't work with that many assholes. I mean, <laughs> one or two, honestly, but. It, I, I I always kind of wanted to because, you know, those are great stories to tell, you know, at dinner parties like, oh, my God, you'll never believe who showed up, <laughs> poked up and whatever. But it didn't happen very much. But but for me, what was so cool about George is that he was just such a gentle person and he's making these really disturbing films. I mean, he really was a big bear of a man. So so in the another question that you may not know the answer to because it's one of those like alternate ending questions. But in the end of the movie, you know, both Melanie and Alan survive and Alan even recovers, you know, to the point he can walk in. It's a perfectly happy ending. Um, But we read that the original ending was not so happy and that he didn't recover. But test audiences like hated it. Do you remember shooting like a not so happy ending or what happened? Well, 
You're going to have to help me because I haven't seen it for a while. But isn't there a dream sequence at the end? There, there is yes. a shock. There is a little carry it's type a- of shock where like the monkey jumps Come out of his body. Yeah, <laughs> which actually I did jump. And but but uh, were we sure that was a dream? I mean, wasn't there a sense of am I wrong? Was there a sense? Well, you of- you pull up in a van and he has crutches. So, so he walks walk- over yeah, to you. That's the very last scene. They, the, yes, because the shock comes. He wakes up in the hospital. It was supposedly just a dream. And then you pull up and pick him up. And he's like on his road to walking again. Okay, I felt like there was some kind of sense that maybe it wasn't over. But um, I, 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 I know what you're saying is true, but I don't really remember yeah. what the ending was. I think it's nice that it was a happier I ending. Know. You I, know, I, I, <laughs> stop. I thought Jason... There, I've seen obviously a ton of horror films. I think he is He's so hot. He is so hot. <laughs> He's so handsome. I I, I don't so, know. No, I agree. That's he just me. Is hot. And it's part of it's that voice. You know, he's got such yes. a. Do you ever watch him on? Is it Chicago PD? He's, no, he, I. He, he was on. I think he was on like Californication for an episode yeah, with David. He's been Dukundi. starring on. Uh, I think it's Chicago PD. Oh. For years, I mean. And, oh yes, right. and I know that he escaped Scientology, which he is did. so did interesting. You ever see that documentary with was it? I the feel like I the Lena Remini, Remini one. No, the oh. HBO one based on the book Going Clear. Yeah, and Jason's all over the book and also the documentary, and it's fascinating. I mean, yeah. he gave them a lot of money, and wow. um, you know, you just have to keep going higher and higher in your training. And then at some point he was like, what? I'm out. <laughs> now. But but wow. how about Ella the monkey? Did, she gave she, all her was money. Was she ever a Scientologist? <laughs> she might have been. That, was, that would explain a lot. Anyway. I can, oh, he I really can see was, After I knew him, I guess deep in it for a while. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. we have just a little quick game for you, um, Kate, where we're just going to ask you some quick questions and you simply have to answer with either House on Sorority Row or Monkey Shines. Don't worry, we're not testing like your knowledge of them or anything. It's really just okay. to pit them against each other. You ready? Okay, cool. Okay. Which do you think is the better overall film? Monkey Shines. Okay. Which have you seen more times in your life? Monkey Shines. Oh. Which had more drama on set during filming? House and Sorority Row. <laughs> Which has more cast members that you're still in touch with today? Neither. Isn't that sad? <laughs> really? I mean, it was 40 years ago, know, so it's okay. You're forgiven. <laughs> you didn't have to say that, Matt. You didn't no, no, no. I'm sorry. It was years. two years ago. I mean, it was last it's a year. miracle any of us are still alive, really. No, that is not true. Um, um, which had more behind-the-scenes romances? <laughs> uh, House and Sorority Row. <gasps> Here to explain? No, no. <laughs> like, no, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, which do you think had the better movie poster? Monkey Shines. I love that poster. I mean, yeah. too. I love it. I, I will love- say one thing that's really funny: the interview with the Mark Rosman of House of Sorority Row. He's talking about how the poster for the movie has nothing to do with the movie. Who is that? It's not me. <laughs> Who is that person? I guess it, the, it probably is, is you. It's it's so, you. Dark, it's not, not me. Yeah, I I know. Mean, yeah. <laughs> it's not me. So I mean, okay, it's the oddest thing. It's clearly to get people thinking it's sexy or whatever. But I would <laughs> like to have worn that in the movie. But it, it looks it, like a romance. Yeah, I was just movie. gonna say that. I, mean, I was just gonna say it looks that's like, so true. It looks yeah. exactly like romance. Novel. I know it's so yeah. weird. Um, w- which do you get asked about more by fans? House and Sorority Row. Mm. Uh, which film had the h- higher gross? Oh, this is a question that has a real answer. Which do you think had the higher gross? If I had to guess, and I don't, I know Monkey Shines did very badly the first weekend, which was so disappointing because, and maybe that's still true, but back in the day, it was like, if you didn't make it in the first weekend, you were, you were a goner and we were gone pretty quick. I would guess House and Sorority Row. You're that right. True. Ten, it made 10.6 million domestically. Wow. Monkey Shines made 5.3. And I got fifty dollars a day. Ten point six million dollars. The star gets five, f- fifty bucks you, a day. I mean, this is none of my business. But do you get residual checks for House on Sorority Row? Never. Oh. But of course, it wasn't SAG, right? Oh, that's was right. Amazing. So, I do for Monkey Shines from time to time because it cool. plays on cable. 
you know, that's how I saw it as a kid. I watched it many times. I thought it was a great movie. I think it's yeah, awesome. I mean, I really, I, there was a lot that I really liked about it. It's, you know, it's not a great movie, but it's kind of creepy and weird. And I think it's a really great premise. It's very unique. It is very, yeah. very unique. I, like, I also feel like Monkey Shines also uh, plays like a play. I mean, you know what I mean? Like the characters are very like, this is his mother. This is the mean nurse. And you're right. like, you're like the right. sweet one. Like, I think it's, I think it could be it could a play. Be like in a couple yeah. sets, I feel like. Because, right. yeah. yeah, exactly. And do you know that the, that nurse was um, George's wife at the time? Oh, George Romero's wife. Oh, yeah. wow. That's she was a- so mean. I mean, she, yeah, yeah she was mean. He was the nicest to her. Though. <laughs> I thought he was. Oh, <laughs> So we just have a couple wrap up questions for you. This has been oh, really okay. awesome. This is just silly. Um, so I couldn't help but notice you did two seasons of a show on Bodies of Evidence with George Clooney. Just a quick side note: What was it like working with George Clooney? It was awesome. I mean, he's another one everybody loves, unless he doesn't like you for some reason. And if he doesn't like you, it's probably because you're just an asshole, you know. <laughs> and he'll let you know. But um, he was so funny. We laughed all the time. There were so many pranks and silliness and giggles. Um, We did not take it terribly seriously, I have to say. Um, And, you know, we were the young ones. It was Lee Horsley who had been, you know, uh, around for a while. And he was ostensibly the lead. But really, I think it was George who kind of was the reason anybody would tune in. And then there was a, a... the guy who played my partner, Al Fan was his name, um, who was quite a bit older. So we just we just had a lot of fun. And I I was crazy about him. Everyone was every single female guest star who came on that show. He would have to hide in his trailer. I'm not kidding. Oh my People God. just were in love with him from you just say he has that thing. Mm-hmm. Did he have a huge gay male following, too? <laughs> Maybe. He might have. We're asking about it. We're, we're, we're asking I mean, I don't know because why he we're wouldn't. part of it. I mean, I think he was the kind of guy that appeals to everybody, which, no. you know, and, and to be honest, I think he got a lot better as a an actor as time went on. Um, but he, you know, he's, uh, women love him, men love him. I don't know why gay men wouldn't love him. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I mean, I loved him on The Facts of Life when I'm sure he was just like, what's acting? Yeah. <laughs> Very cute on Roseanne, too. Oh, yeah, yeah Booker. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. So, he, got, he got a lot better looking, I think, as time went on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of those hairstyles, well, 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 time you know, has been... The 80s were rough, my friend. Uh, time has been very kind to George Clooney. Yes, it has. Yes. So uh, another thing we wanted to ask you about, we we read that you ended up getting your master's in special education and now work as an educational therapist. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you kind of transitioned from acting to that role? Sure. I did continue acting while I was an educational therapist. I was able to do both, but... I, you know, the truth is, quite honestly, I could see the writing on the wall. The older I got, the less I worked. I mean, you could take it decade by decade. You know, one is age and two is because of the nature of the business changed so much. You know, if you're not a star, I mean, for instance, let's take George Clooney. It's he it's it's not just that it's the misogyny. Right. I mean, I had some chances. I did some series and they a couple. And they didn't make it. And I didn't get too many more chances. George made a million pilots, a million series until he got on Sisters. And then that led to ER and the rest is history. But it was very, very different for women. You know, you you only got so many opportunities. It felt like to me. And the older I got, it's funny, too, when you're young, you just think it's going to keep on coming. It's going to keep on coming. I. I've told this story many times, but I I was very young and I thought I was going to be an important actress. And they kept offering me this miniseries um, harem. And I was supposed to star opposite the great actor from Dr. Zhivago. Help me out here. Omar Sharif. Omar Sharif. I was going to be in his harem. And it was going to shoot in Europe in amazing places, but I kept turning it down because it was like, I'm not getting in those harem pants. It's so embarrassing. This is so horrible. They got up to like $350,000. And uh, this is 
I'm very young and I turned it down. Now I look back and I'm like, what is wrong with you? I mean, why did you do that? That was so stupid. But you think that the opportunity is going to keep coming and they don't or they didn't for me. And, and if you don't get some kind of hit on there, you know, something that's really popular, it's hard to translate into continued work. So it just got harder and harder. I was working less and less and it was mostly guest star stuff, right? Um, which I'm grateful for. I had fun, but you know, when you've been number one or two or three on the call sheet and then you're number 25, it's not your ego. It wasn't that. It was that you're you're just never really at home on the set. You know, you're just, it's a hard place to be. So anyway, there's a long way of saying I knew, I knew what was coming and I needed to do something of value that I felt good about. And I didn't want to be one of those people sitting around in a room with all the other. I mean, I would be in audition rooms, guys, with actresses who won Academy Awards, you know, people who were, you know, had been around for a long time, who I knew. I mean, I did guest, guest star roles with Celeste Holm, uh, Vera Allen from, um, not Vera, um, from all the John Ford films. I mean, amazing. Diane Baker, people who I had seen in, in great films that were just trying to get a gig like me. Mm -hmm. And I just, I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to do that. So I went back, I got, I, it was hard to figure out what I wanted to do, but I've always been fascinated in education and I've always been fascinated in I love kids. So I became something called an educational therapist, which was I worked with kids with learning disabilities one-on-one um, -on -one for about almost 20 years. But right before I came here, I, I retired. Oh. But now I'm working as an advocate for kids in foster care. That's uh, amazing. That, that's really great. Really. That's that's awesome. And congr do you say congratulations to people on retirement? Yeah, right? Oh, yeah, I well, chose congratulations. Yeah. I acting. I chose to retire from this yes. profession. So no, that's well, that's well until House on Sorority 2 comes. Yeah, to until it. you become until, that, until you reprise yeah. Katie. Yeah. I could be starring here in Greensboro in Arsenic and Old Lace in a few a few years. I you love know. that play. Yes, I do too. I I I uh, I'm gonna play one of the old ladies one of these days. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh. Um, have you ever done a horror movie convention? No. Never. Would you ever do one? I don't know. Maybe. I will. Uh, I will tell you this. We've convinced certain people on this show to do it. You no, know, to be honest, like a lot of people who are a little hesitant are wondering, like, you know, oh my God, who are the people yeah. coming here? Is it weird? And they usually say, like, they have the best time because a lot of, as you can tell, like horror fans are very devoted and they're just like, yeah. um, they love I mean, meeting I've people. Episodes of um, different Star Treks through the years to know that there's a big market out there for mm -hmm. anyone who has anything to do with that world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I have nothing against it whatsoever. Um, no one's ever asked me. Oh, well, I think you well, should just do one, just to feel it yeah. out. Because yeah, I mean, I everyone think... knows House on Sorority Row. Every, yeah. if you're, if you're a horror fan, you know how, and Monkey really? Show. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh yes, yeah. yes, definitely. Yeah, they definitely horror fans know, especially 80s horror fans. And, and then, um, because you were on the two episodes of them, which is hard, do you think there could be any more horror in your future? <laughs> I don't rule it out. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't rule anything out. It's just that it's hard to imagine here in Greensboro, North Carolina, that something's going to fall in my lap, but you just never know. Where's yeah. the Halloween I movie? Loved, no, what? I think the Halloween a lot of things do film here. That's yeah. true. But you know, it's usually like Wilmington is a big bastion for shooting. You know, this is a right to work state. That's why they like to shoot here, because they don't have to pay people very well. <laughs> Opinions are not loved here in North Carolina. I'm sure. No mystery why they come here. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not terribly close to me. You know, it's funny, guys. I loved what I did and I loved acting and all that, but I don't really miss it that much. I Makes really sense. don't. Yeah. I mean, I've had my SAG card for 20 years. I'm not making this about me, um, but I'm just saying like, it is, it is tough. Like I, 
I mean, what little auditions I've had, it's it's you have to have a really thick skin. I yeah, I don't know that I ever had a really thick skin. I got better at it, but I never got over that feeling when you go in there and you do a great job. You're like, go home. You're like, oh, yeah, of course, they're going to call me. I mean, I should have known better. You know, there's five million things that you're not in control of. But it was the sense that you should be rewarded for good work and you're not necessary. I mean, when we've talked to people, like it's like anything can be the reason you don't get a role, anything, the color walk, of your hair. Yeah. You walk in wearing a sweater that they're the casting director's uh, sister, yeah. boyfriend. We hate her. Me yeah. when they were in. <laughs> it's like anything. So too, here's a funny story for you guys. I did a not very good movie for Showtime starring Anne Heche and Eric. He's got Stoltz. Oh, Stoltz. Eric Stoltz. Yes, 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 yes. Some kind of wonderful. And um, I had very blonde, short hair. And of course, Anne Heche had very blonde, short hair. So, and it was like a military thing. And I was going to be a military lawyer, kind of butch. So uh, they dyed my hair very red, dark red. And then I got on set and Eric Stoltz sees me in the makeup trailer. And he says, do we look too much alike? <gasps> like, well, fuck you, Eric Stoltz. <laughs> Second of all, I, I thought I would get fired. I dyed my hair so I don't look like animation. Now I supposedly look like look Eric like Stoltz. Eric Stoltz. <laughs> That's amazing. That was another humiliating story. Oh my. <laughs> well, I feel like because that leads us to our final question. We asked this to everyone that we yes. interview. And funny enough, you've kind of told us a bunch of things that would qualify under this, but I'm still going to um, ask what this. Um, but um, what is one thing that you can tell us about your experience, either working on The House on Sorority Row or Monkey Shines that you've never told any other interviewer, publication, convention, Q&A, podcaster, even if it's one tiny thing about your experience working on either film that you've never told in an interview? Uh, well, so many years later, it doesn't really matter. And who cares? But I did have a little fling on House and Sorority Row with the one of the stage managers or ADs <laughs> he actually went on to be a pretty big deal. He worked for Eric Roth through you can look it up, Matt. He worked. Oh, I'm time. trying to oh, I was trying to jump in. Peter, I was like, wait, I need to know who it is. Peter, Peter, um, Peter, pumpkin eater. Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater. Um, uh, he was an AD. I'm trying to think. I don't know where you find. Oh, was it um wait, there's Paul Schiff. That's it, Paul Schiff. Wasn't oh. Peter. It was Paul Schiff. It was wow. Paul so just a little, just a little film romance. Just a little film romance. I really liked him. I think more than he liked me. Oh, he story went, of my life. <laughs> and then he went on to work for MTV, and then somehow he became like a protege of Peter Ross at Fox, and became a very, very big deal, and produced a lot of movies. Blah blah blah. See, he should have liked me. Um, <laughs> but yes, I had a little fling on that. But by the time I did Monkey Shines, I was happily married and a mama. So we've gotten all sorts of answers on this from <laughs> flings to just random party yeah. stories to all sorts of we, whatever. We have that making a movie is like summer camp. Like you do have that summer romance. And then when the movie's over, it's right. over. <laughs> and it's sort of the same with friendships, though, too, that are so intense. And you just think you're going to be like George Clooney. I just thought we were going to be friends forever. And then, you know, he became a movie star and never saw him again. But, you know, it's so intense at the time. But then people just sort of go their separate ways, which is kind of sad. But um, but I have great partying stories, but I don't really feel like I can share them because that's not just telling on me. That's telling uh, me. <laughs> OK, so I lean. So I lean Davidson. I lean Davidson <laughs> was. No, no um, um, you have been incredible. Kate, thank you so much for doing this. Interview. Really my pleasure, guys. You're so sweet. And it reminds me that I used to be an actress. <laughs> In the best films, we love them. Yeah, I mean, seriously, you have a ton of fans. And um, well, we will definitely be in touch as to when Please the um, interview is going to come out. And thank you so much. Really, you've been an absolute delight. Please, that was so much fun. And My pleasure. Love I, you guys. And I'll be your friends on Facebook or anywhere, anytime. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and thank you. And hi Olivia. Yes. Oh my God. I totally will. I love Olivia. I love you. Yes. Thank you so much, Kate. Okay. We'll talk with you soon. Take care. I look forward to it. Bye, okay, guys. Bye.
We hope you enjoyed this episode of Happy Horror Time. This podcast is hosted by Tim Murdoch and myself, Matt Emmert. It's co-produced by Jacob Randall. We release new episodes every Monday and we switch off between reviewing new horror films with spoilers and interviewing horror stars. So there's something for everyone. You can listen to the podcast directly from our website. That's www.happyhorrortime.com or from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you stream podcasts. And if you'd like to support us, please sign up to be a patron at www.patreon.com slash happy horror time. Patrons get access to our monthly bonus episodes where we discuss past horror films according to a theme. They get to vote on those themes. They get our monthly newsletter, the Happy Horror Times and autographed Happy Horror Time stickers. If you haven't already, make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Happy Horror Time. And since our movie reviews do contain spoilers, we always post the films we're going to review a few days in advance on our social pages, just in case you want to watch them beforehand and be in the know with us. And finally, if you'd like to contact us directly, send an email to happyhorrortime at gmail.com. We especially love it when you tell us how sexy we are. I'm Matt Emmert. And I'm Tim Murdoch. And we hope you have a happy horror time. time.